Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah Show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send your emails to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode. The Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour with me, my co-host Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. How are you doing this week, Noah? I'm doing great. And we have you via a fancy new little Linux box sending four different RTSP streams back to the studio. So you should sound a lot better this week. Yeah, thanks to MindDrip Media for the upgrade. Yeah, happy to help. All right, our first email, Steve, comes in from Eric. Eric writes in and says, Hi, Noah and Steve. First, a technical question for you less savvy listeners like me. When I taught myself Linux two or three years ago, I was trying distros like Ubuntu, Mint, and Manjaro. I love the freedom and financial efficiency, but I found a constant game of whack-a-mole that killed my productivity to the point that I tucked tail and went back to Mac. Can you recommend any way for us non-tech whiz types to overcome that hurdle efficiently and switch to Linux? Secondly, a philosophical question. How do you recognize when the potential business partner aligns with your foundational perspective requirement stemming from Philippians 2.4 or Matthew 20.28? 20, Is it purely intuitive, like recognize like, or do you have a process? Appreciatively, Eric. So I guess, Steve, let's start with technical. What's your thoughts on the best? Really what he's asking is what's the, what's the best go-to all around distro for just, I want to use it and get work done. What would that be for you? Hmm. Well, what it is for me and what I might hand out to other people, I think are different. Um, okay. I tend to like to give people mint, um, to be honest. I think that the cinnamon interface is familiar and it brings a level of comfort to people to be in something that's familiar. I also think that it's a slower moving, especially in the last couple of years where they've decided that they're going to kind of move from LTS to LTS, which means uh, the base changes less frequently. And for most people, they live inside the browser these days. And so they just need a stable base for the browser to run on. Um, I'd be curious to find out what kind of bumps and you know what kind of whack-a-mole they were playing because it's been a long time since i have recognized that to be a problem mm. i'd say back 2010 ish was where it started to actually get good i'd say in quotations and it probably disappeared for me completely around 2014 between supporting my in-laws and my extended family, the support calls dropped off significantly at that point. I, I, I can understand where he's coming from. You know, you tell somebody, go to Ubuntu, get stock Ubuntu, and then they get it and they go, where's the minimize button? Okay, well, install GNOME tweaks. Okay, well, I've done that. And I, I don't know. And then you get a certain way, a certain level down that way. And then all of a sudden we jump ship and we go to a different distro. And But that has its own set of of quirks. I, I guess I, I, I can kind of see where he's coming from. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's a big difference between Mint specifically and just an Ubuntu base with Cinnamon? I say that because some of the security practices that Mint puts out there by default um, are curious. I actually don't have much of a problem with, with the, let's say, way that they handle security. I like that they tag their updates with various colors and levels so that you can kind of go in and easily just say, you know, auto apply levels one and two and three, four and five, just completely ignore them until I actually show up or VPN in and, and actually take care of that for them. But do you have you used an Ubuntu base with cinnamon and would that accomplish a lot of the same things? So. I, I want to say it was the late night Linux guys that were talking about Cinnamon recently. And I think it was Joe Resinkin that said, if you want to use Cinnamon, you probably should be using Mint because it, it really does feel at home. I've, I've tried putting Cinnamon on other desktops and it, it works fine, but it's just like taking Mate and putting Mate on 
another underlying base. It's just not quite the same. It was meant to to mm. live in that specific home, and that's where you'll have the best experience. Okay. Well, I I would uh, I would uh, respectfully disagree with Steve on 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 a recommendation. I th- there are some things about Mint that kind of concern me. Um, I've been a big fan of Kubuntu. I've used it for a long time, and I'm kind of the Walmart of Linux users. I expect it to fire up. I expect it to run the applications that I need to run, which for me are a mail client, web browser, a terminal, and a communications platform. And, and past that, it just it just sort of works. And the layout of the KDE desktop kind of mimics that of the Windows, which I, I think is 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 kind of the a similar appeal to why people like the Cinnamon desktop. It kind of has that Windows-esque experience. Um, but either one of those routes would be good. I, I guess what's in common there is you notice that we're all kind of centering around that Ubuntu base. And a big part of that is community support. When you Google a question, when you ask in a community, chances are that problem's been solved in Ubuntu. The further out you get into esoteric distros, a lot of times the more tweaking and refinement that goes on in certain areas, but you also kind of put yourself out there. So that's, I guess, something to consider. On to the philosophical side, Steve. How do you recognize when a business partner allies with your foundational requirements? So um, have you dealt with that at all? In Insofar as I, I used to have my, well, I suppose technically it's still active. I just haven't used it in a long time. I have a, a corporation that I set up for doing consulting. And so I suppose in some small way I have because I did it with um, a partner of mine. Largely... It comes back to how good are you at reading people because, and and how much time have you spent with them? That that's ultimately what it comes down to because lots of people can put lacquer over less desirable traits. And I don't mean anything nefarious by that. I just mean we all want to put our best foot forward. And sometimes that can make it hard to discern where their true feelings are. And it's, it's difficult. I'd say that that choosing a partner is not something to be taken lightly. Like you don't just jump into it and think it'll work out. It should be something that you do very thoughtfully. And you, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, you study the person that you are ultimately going to have to, it's almost like a marriage. You know, if, if you're really intending to stick in the business for a long time, it really is like choosing a life partner. And so you do this very carefully. I think, what would you do? Um, so I would start here. 80% of all business partnerships fail. And you, so you should know that going into any sort of business partnership. If the ones that do work out are ones in where it's really kind of two individuals kind of cohabitating. So things like doctor's office, lawyer office, um, they have their own client base. Maybe they share a little bit and they share some communal office staff and that kind of thing, but they're kind of off doing their own thing. Um, there are five things, and I'm, 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 gonna, I'm stealing this for Dave Ramsey. There are five things that uh, cause business partnerships to fail, and he calls them the five Ds, death, disability, disinterest, drugs, or divorce. Um, and you need, to be perfe- you need to be prepared to handle all five of those things. So you ask the question from a Christian perspective, so I will try to answer it from a Christian perspective. If you have a, a shared value system, um, that can make conflict easier to solve because you have a central point of truth to come back to and reference. And as far as a methodology of figuring that out, I personally would have a very direct uh, conversation. I would sit down and I would ask the person, hey, where is your heart at with this? You know, where is your walk with God? Where where do you uh, where do you find truth and where do you center your life? And if you get answers that mimic what you would say to yourself in the mirror, um, then it's maybe something you consider. But the first question I would ask myself if I were you is, is, is this anything that you could do on your own? Do you need a partner? And if you want to go into business with somebody else, can you structure the relationship su- such that you have one person who owns the thing and one person who works the thing? And it can be the other guy. You can have him own it and he can just pay you and you can split the money 50, 50. Um, but it, Business relation partnerships almost always fail, and if you do that with a friend, you run the risk of ruining your friendship. And so, I, I would it, I would caution you in the strongest possible way. If you find yourself already in a business relationship with a, a partner, then yeah, I would sit down. I would take that person out for a cup of coffee, and I would sit down and have a conversation with him. 
So hopefully that answers your question. If you want more details, I think there's a lot more we could do with that. Um, so just write us back. And thanks for writing in, Eric. Our second email comes in from Doug. Doug writes in and says, Hi, Noah and Steve. I love the show. Oblig obligatory longtime listener. Please keep up the good work. I guess my question is this. How do you decide when it's time to move to managed service provider? Contacts below. I'm the sole IT provider for a company with around 90 employees, and I've inherited a mixed bag of servers, email server, Active Directory, intranet, warehouse, stock management, all, et cetera, et cetera. And then he goes on to describe a little bit about his IT infrastructure. And he says, I'm considering taking two problems at the same time by going for Microsoft Office 365 to get our office licenses and email sorted out at the same time. But I don't want to sound like I'm giving up. I'd love to keep other things running on site, but I have to manage an email server and I know others can do it better. Is this my best option or the kindest option for the person who eventually takes over for me? Cheers, Doug. So, Steve, this is pro I don't think you could have written it at the risk of tooting our own horn. I feel like you couldn't have written into two better guys to ask this question. Um, so I spend a disproportionate amount of my week telling businesses that they should own their own infrastructure. And you spend a disproportionate amount of your week working with businesses that own their own infrastructure um, or and, and manage that. Um, and that's largely what Red Hat does. So. Tell me a little bit about or talk to me a little bit about what advice you would give um, to Doug as far as when is it appropriate to not manage something in-house, to hand that off to somebody else because you either don't have the budget, you don't have the time, you don't have the staff, or you don't have the knowledge to do it efficiently and effectively on-site. This is a fun conversation. This would be a, like, let's talk for two or three hours after mm. after a talk. Um coming from a guy who just bought four servers for my server room, like, you know, uh, one of my servers is 28 cores with 48 threads and 256 gigs of RAM. Anyways, all that to say is um, I have a lot vested in running things myself. Having said that, I would absolutely get rid of the Exchange server. I would not run email myself if I could at all extract myself from that. And this is from a guy who up until last year, I staunchly ran my own email server and didn't didn't complain about it either. You you liked it. I did. I loved it. But I also know that it takes care and feeding. And as I decided to continue to self host various things, um, email was just that thing. It normally runs and it normally runs fine. But when it breaks, first of all, it's a I can't wait to stop and do this. Uh, I have to do this now. So it has to be a thing that if you're going to keep it yourself, you have to know that you have to stop everything to fix it because email is something that it really can't be down for too long. Like I mitigated it by using um, DNS spooling and backup services. So like um, what will happen is if you go to certain providers, what they'll do is they'll cache your MX, anything that's coming through your MX records for you. So if they get a bounce at the server, they keep a copy of that. And then they send it when your server's back up. So you can kind of mitigate some of this stuff, but you can't really afford to keep it down because email is just considered so critical. Um, with 90 employees, I'd have to imagine you've got a lot on your plate. So um, it's a balancing act of what, what you want to do, what you think you can do, and what you know you can do. And... I think that especially the way that Microsoft's going, you're not a big shop. I think they're eventually going to pull Exchange out of the corporate hands and yep. put it up into the cloud. Yep. And I'd say don't fight that. <laughs> you know, let them take it. So, um, so I, I really resonate with what you said as far as knowing what you can do. I, I you're, you'd be hard pressed to find a bigger advocate for own your own data, run your own infrastructure. We tell businesses that all day long, and I mean it. However. If you're going to do that, you have to know, not guess, not think, you have to know that you're going to be able to keep those services up and running. Because like Steve said, if the email server goes down, it doesn't matter if you're in Hawaii with your family and on the beach, you're going to be finding the nearest internet connection and sitting out in the rain on your, on your laptop and figuring out why the exchange server went down and getting it back up. There are some things that people can't 
so if you want to manage that, or if you decide, if you make an intentional decision that, hey, I want to manage email in-house, I want to do all of this, that's fine. But then teach yourself the technology to get get a handle on high availability and putting servers in and having failover and all of that kind of stuff. And when you can get that kind of redundancy in there, um, then you can feel comfortable saying, all right, now I'm going to host something extraordinarily essential on our server. The other way you can go about that is you can kind of take a hybrid approach. You can do something where you manage the server or you manage the service and have that running on somebody else's infrastructure and you rent that infrastructure until you build your own that you're comfortable with. But, um, you know, Steve ran his own mail server. He was very comfortable with it. I have had terrible luck with it. Um, that's not to say that it can't be done. It's to say that I don't know how to do it well. I worked at a company, or we supported a company, I should say, that um, had two full-time mail administrators, and they still had issues with their exchange server. Everyone, not very often, but every once in a while, you wouldn't be able to get email to the company once or twice a year. And um, that just doesn't, we just don't see that with things like G Suite or Office 365 or FastMail. And so we have an entire episode on mail providers and I'll, we'll have that link for you in the show notes at podcast.asknowashow.com. I highly recommend you check out that episode. It goes through a number of the different mail providers, including ones that you can self-host. It gives you kind of an idea of, of where you might be at. Um, as far as the kindest option for the person that ta eventually takes over for you, that really has less to do about what things are with a managed service provider and what things are hosted locally and far more to do with how well you've documented what's set up. I've been at plenty of businesses that have managed service providers and you can't get to anything and don't know how anything is set up because nothing was documented. And I've been at plenty of places where things are hosted all in-house and everything's documented fine. And so the, it was taking over is a breeze. Um, so it really comes down to how good the communication and transition process is between handing those jobs off. Yeah, I think that as a parting thought, you know, we're talking, he's talking about, um, you know, Libra office or only office. I would say, what are the things that, that occupy your time? And do you want to be doing, let's, let's call it low level tech support, right? You're talking about help desk sort of things when you're sorting around, somebody's office suite because you'll get the call that says hey i can't figure out how to make the spreadsheet do whatever mm. because somebody sent me this esoteric formula that they've they've made a wizard you know they've enchanted and it does all these magical things except it doesn't work for me and do you you know if you have the time and the inclination that's great i'm not trying to discourage that but um I was the sole IT provider for a company of 25 and I didn't want to do that because I had other things that I needed to do. So you really need to sit down and think about uh, what battles you want to fight because ultimately you're, if you're fine with, with sorting out those problems and there are people that are, all the more power to you. I prefer to be working on servers and not help desk related tasks. So that's just something you'll have to think about. Our third email comes in from Wayne. Wayne writes in and says, hi, Noah and Steve. Thanks for all your hard work and advice. I never miss an episode. I know you use Lenovo ThinkPads in your business. I'd love to switch off the keyboard backlight and the LED in my ThinkPad. I'm using Ubuntu Mate. Is there a way to set the keyboard backlight off as default behavior and switch it on only when I want it? Currently, it comes on anytime I start typing or when I plug it in. I appreciate the advice. Best wishes. So I, so far as I'm aware, you just hit function spacebar and it will shut the keyboard backlight off. Um, as far as like a, is there a way that you can go in and just tell it never turn the keyboard backlight on? Might be in the UEFI. I guess I'm not entirely sure. Um, Steve and I were kind of chewing on some of the stuff before the episode, and Steve said, "I want my keyboard backlight on." So I'm, so I, I mean, that would be another option too. Is I'm, if you don't ever use it, just replace it. But um, yeah, I think function spacebar will just toggle that that keyboard off, and then it shouldn't come on when you type. I don't think that will survive a reboot, um, and uh, I don't know if it will survive uh, in and out of standby. Steve, you're not really a ThinkPad guy you have one but you don't use it much right i have three and i don't use any of them except for the one that's currently running fedora so no not really our fourth email comes in from jeremy jeremy writes in and says hey i wanted to share some info and ask a question first I came across an interesting Linux forensic tool recently. The first actually comes from Microsoft. It's written in Rust and allows for live memory capture similar to what Lime Capture does, but without the need to build a custom kernel module. The link is here. Secondly, I'd like to share a partner tool. 
and then he links to volatility. This allows you to create memory profiles for Linux, Mac, and Windows, raw memory dumps so that you can view network connections, shell history, running processes, and much more. Finally, do you know of any resource outlining a comprehensive runbook for incident response? Have you ever had to go through this process? Best. Jeremy, Steve, your thoughts. Uh, we were talking about this before the, before the show regarding runbooks, and really we were kind of puzzled by this because you make a runbook for each incident type as opposed to incident responses, unless you're just simply saying, like, do we have a generic troubleshooting guide? In which case, I think the answer is generally no, because the the experienced troubleshooters don't think to write down things like, have you tried turning it off and on again? Because we just go there. And when, when someone says, have you documented this? We don't even think to write it down. Uh, so what do you think, Noah? Yeah, so like, like I said uh, before the show, like we have documented processes, processes, I guess, for different kind of scenarios that come up. So what do you mean by incident? We like, So one thing that we deal with a lot is uh, malware. Malware comes up, I'd say once or twice a year, we have a client or someplace that we work that gets hit with malware. And we absolutely have a process of what to do. And it looks something like this. It's very not very complicated. Uh, shut everything down. If, if, if we're telling clients to do it because we don't necessarily trust them to understand the power button and the difference between off and on. I know that sounds like that should be obvious, but it's not. Um, so we'll typically tell them to pull the network cables out of the back. Um, and then we come in and we clean one machine at a time and bring them online slowly. But that's a wildly different process from vandalism, a wildly different process from uh, damage of the building for like fire or flooding, wildly different process for thing like theft. So there's different processes that you follow uh, for those. What I would tell you as far as resources and out outlining a, a, a plan, the a lot of times you 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 can get a ton of uh, a ton of um, ground covered just by sitting down in a coffee shop and saying, "Okay, I have absolutely nothing, and I have to rebuild this business. What do I need?" Um, and so usually that looks something like they have some sort of files or data sets. So how do we reestablish that? Oftentimes they'll have some sort of utility software. If it's a carpet store, they have carpet software. If it's a paint store, they have paint software. If it's a hotel, they have hospitality software. So what is the software platform? How do we get that back up and running? Now you need a, a way for people to be able to interface to these things. Well, how do we get that, those things there? And when you can define some of those key components and a path to, to, to rebuild essentially from scratch, that's when you get to the point where you can say, okay, so in the event of a fire, I would lose everything thing and I would have to do all of that in the event of malware I'd probably have the router and the switches and all of that stuff but I wouldn't have you know and you can kind of work your way back we have a guy that works for us he's he was on the show during the Alta Speed episode and his name is Peter and Peter is working on a process in which we can start with a bunch of servers and you set them all up and he's working on this in his home lab but you spin up a a machine to run an Ansible playbook you leave for lunch and the Ansible playbook will reach out, see what servers are on the network, give them their IP addresses, install their operating systems, start configuring them. And like from start to finish, you started with a bunch of empty machines and an empty switches and empty access points and the whole nine yards. And by the time you come back, everything has been touched over SSH and everything is up and running uh, with a, a series of, of uh, Ansible playbooks and, and kickstart and, and all of the things. Um, and so that's kind of like the extreme level of, of planned and, and preparedness, but just being able to take something apart and put it back together is a good way to start analyzing how would you respond to any given incident. Um, and I would prioritize that based on what you think the most likely incident to be is. So I'll tell you a couple of them. Uh, malware, you're going to, if you work in IT, you will deal with malware at some point. A security compromise. If you work in IT, you will deal with a security compromise at some point. Theft and or unauthorized access. If you work in IT, you will deal with theft or unauthorized access at some point. Um, and so if you can plan for some of those things and think, how would I respond? I think that will get you a good long way. Our fifth email comes in from Kevin. Kevin writes in and says, hey guys, recently discovered your show and I love it. Two quick questions. 
I'm looking to set up a PC as a kiosk that can only view a predetermined web page. When the kiosk PC is inactive, I would like the PC screensaver to display a company marketing advertising content. This could be as simple as a slideshow. Also, resetting the browser to the main homepage would be ideal. I've not had luck doing this with Win 10 kiosk mode. I'm open to any OS or config. Frequently, I need to share sensitive information with others. I'm currently using services like Burn after reading Burn after the readme.me or one one time secret. Dot com. Do you have a favorite of your own? So I'm going to answer the first part of the question. I'm going to let our interview answer the second part of the question. Uh, as far as kiosk mode, I highly recommend you just check out uh, Firefox kiosk mode. I don't know that that's going to get you the uh, the screensaver uh, marketing material, although you could do that with like X screensaver or something like that and just have it pointed at a pictures folder. Um the other thing you might check out, we deploy a, a kiosk system called Libra Kiosk for all of our customers uh, in it, that run hotels. And so you go to any hotel that we manage the IT for, and if you go walk up, it's essentially an immutable operating system. You walk up to it, you use it. When you walk away or you click on the logout, it bounces the machine and wipes everything that you did to it. Um, and so you, we can, you can um, lock that down to a, a certain series of pages um, or just put a couple of icons on the desktop so they can only get to particular pieces of software. We can put links for that in the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Our uh, sixth and final email comes in from Mike. Mike writes in and says, greetings from Northwest Georgia. I've been looking at removing Google services out of my daily life and I've been looking really hard at Nextcloud prefer to still have access to my Nextcloud instance when I'm away from home. I looked at trying one of the Nextcloud recommended providers, but I'd have to trust them with my data. I'm not necessarily against that, but would love some recommendations from your listeners to do that. Um, then he talks about he was experimenting with zero tiers, a way to get access to his home network, and it worked well after watching his NVR via RDP, but it seems reasonable that the same could be done with zero tier and Nextcloud. Would it be fairly secure? I wonder if any of your listeners have tried that and what they thought about it. Um, so, Steve, thoughts on Nextcloud, thoughts on Nextcloud on using something like L Linode or DigitalOcean to host it himself, using one of the providers, and uh, thought on Zero Tier as a way to access his home network? So I looked at Zero Tier ahead of time, and essentially it's it looks like a network tool to combine things together, something similar to Tink or other kind of mesh networky type things not exactly sure i couldn't because there's a lot of marketing stuff on there um, it looked like it was going to do some nat busting so i assume that you have to install a package and it calls out to their server and that's how they you know kind of help tunnel things through i mean when you're whenever you're using a service like that you just have to know that they they have access to be able to look at the traffic um, because you don't I mean, this this is true anytime your information passes through anybody's switch, but you don't know if they're mirroring the port and then, you know, capturing the packets or doing anything like that. And that's not to scare people. That's just a that's just a general, you know, PSA. Um, I run Nextcloud. I I host it myself out of my house, and uh, I haven't had a problem with this. You got to keep it up to date because if you're putting anything on the internet, that's how it goes. Um, I host it myself largely because of the large data set that I have attached to it, um, which make, makes LinNode or DigitalOcean not really sufficient for how I use Nextcloud. Um, love it. I think it's a great project and it's super flexible. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would go the route with starting on DigitalOcean. And then if that doesn't work out, if that does work out for you, then I would move maybe on to my own infrastructure. Otherwise, I'd probably stick with something like a Nextcloud provider. Either way, you have the Nextcloud provider is going to have to care a little bit more about your privacy than Google is, or you'll probably run somewhere else. From the Linux Newswire newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. The Linux Foundation has launched three open source training courses on edX. Linux for Developers, Linux Tools for Software Development, and Git for Distributed Software Development. The three courses can be taken individually or combined to earn a professional certificate in open source software development. Linus Torval makes a code commit in Git claiming that he is Satoshi, the father of Bitcoin. Time will tell if this is just a troll or a confession. Brian Romero, a University of New Mexico doctoral candidate, has developed an open source GPU capable of processing fluid dynamic simulations. Leon AI, your open source personal assistant, 
has put out its 1.01 release of its CLI interface. In gaming news, Intel has worked to develop resizable bar on Intel GPUs, which may result in better performance for gamers on Intel Arc GPUs. Valve has worked to update the Vulkan driver to give users of the Steam Deck more battery life. And never let anyone say age matters in open source. A 12-year-old developer has created Gamebuntu, which helps users install their choice of one of four launchers, two kernels, seven tools, and a streaming app. In corporate news, Sunatype, a software supply chain management service for open source software, surpassed $100 million in annual revenue and is eyeing an IPO. Integrity Culture, a Japanese food tech company, has netted $7 million in Series A funding to develop an open source cellular agricultural infrastructure platform. And in news from Europe, the Belgian city of Fresin launches open source digital public services. Four Finnish cities collaborate to develop, manage, and maintain an open source ERP system for early childhood education. Middle schools in Brittany, France deployed the open source Nextcloud and Calabra to 21 middle schools, accounting for 12,000 users between teachers and students. The new German federal government has decided that open source will be a cornerstone of Germany's digital state. It declared that open source software plays an important role in Germany. Interoperability, data portability, open standards, and open source are all named as prerequisites to achieve digital sovereignty. Joining us on the program, it's Alfred Avilas and John Maurer. Uh, they are the technical training manager and channel development, respectively, for Bitwarden. Welcome into the program, gentlemen. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, thank you so much, Noah. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate you guys taking the time. So I, I want to start with this. There's a lot of password managers out there, and certainly people have either heard of a password manager or maybe they're using one. So tell me a little bit about Bitwarden. How did you guys get started, and what sets Bitwarden apart from the competition? Yeah, well, I, I can answer that question, Noah. So Bitwarden was actually founded by Kyle Spearin, who's still part of the company, who actually used LastPass for the longest time but got fed up with some of the LastPass practices and just decided he wanted to build the password manager that he wanted to see. And so how Bitwarden handle privacy differently and what makes us unique is number one, our foundation on open source transparency. So as an enterprise, it is important for us as an organization that if you're trusting us with our, your secrets, that we are being um, open and transparent with how our platform works and that it's audited by our community. We also engage with um, third party um, auditors to ensure that what we say we do is what we do. And then compared to some of the um, some of the competition, you know, not all password managers operate on a zero knowledge encryption basis. Tell me a little bit about what zero knowledge encryption is and why that's part of the thing that sets uh, separates Bitwarden out. Yeah, so I'll take that one. So Bitwarden is a zero knowledge uh, encryption password manager. So what that means is that Bitwarden cannot view um, your master password for one or access your vault. So everything that all your uh, secrets that are in your vault are actually secret. We don't have any access to your vault. Um, we can't reset your master password. Um, that Those are, are your secrets. So um, that just means that your secrets are your secrets. So we have zero knowledge of um, your master password or the items that are in your vault. Why is Bitwarden open source? It seems like if you were using LastPass and you didn't like it, there'd be a temptation to say, you know what, I'm going to make the password manager that I want, and then I'm going to make all the money from selling it. And that's not what happened here. We're relying on open source, and we're relying on the community and you're essentially willing to give this code away and somehow Bitwarden has managed to stack tremendous value on top of that so that people come back for that value added service. Talk to me a little bit about what the culture is like inside of Bitwarden and how open source is a part of that. Yeah, and so at Bitwarden, because open source is so important, it's one of our key foundations internally and externally to be fully transparent with our internal policies as well as with our community. 
And so again, touching on why open source is such a key foundation, if you're trusting us with your biggest secrets, you want to know that you have the confidence that our platform operates how we say it works. And so that's what really is a differentiator and why we think it is such important, uh, important pillar of Bitwarden so that you know we're doing what we say we do. From the community aspect, aspect, it's a great way to ensure that our product is also meeting the needs of its users. And so, you know, if you ever go to us at bitwarden.com forward slash community, it's a great way to engage with our um, community, see the roadmap changes, see what's being discussed on our boards, as well as taking a look at our GitHub to see what are the new topics and new changes that are coming down with our platform. So somebody out there is listening to this and they're saying to themselves, okay, fine. I've looked into a password manager before, but I, I don't know if that's for me. It just seems like one more thing that I have to manage and one more thing that I have to remember. So can you tell me a little bit about why somebody would want to use a password manager? And then what are the requirements for selecting a, a good master password? And do I have to change that frequently like I would with all of my other passwords? All right, well, let me take that one. So I can tell you before I started working for Bitwarden, I've never didn't uh, I've never heard of a password manager. So I basically used the password manager that was built into my browser, um, but didn't realize that it was an actual password manager. Um, so when I started working for Bitwarden and started using the product, I didn't realize um, that I had over 600 individual uh, credentials that I was using on, you know, a various um, basis, but I had over 600 credentials. So those that was 600 passwords and username combinations. Um, and I really um, wasn't being very safe with my, um, my, my virtual profile. So I was reusing passwords, I was using, um, you know, not very uh, strong or unique passwords. So I was actually opening myself up to to actually being hacked because I didn't know any better at the time. So when you, you know, I was one of those people um, that said, this is one more thing that I would have to um, remember, but it actually made my life a whole lot easier when the only thing I have to remember is one single master password. So all of those other passwords that I had and the over 600 credentials that I had, I was able to go back into my vault and slowly, bit by bit, change all of the passwords to something strong and unique. So I never repeated the same password twice. Um, so if there was ever a breach, instead of have um, you know a bad actor coming and uh, having access to everything because I was reusing the, the passwords over and over or being extremely uh, clever and just putting a one, two, or three at the end of it or a dollar sign or something. Um, now, every password stands alone or every credential stands alone because it's a unique username and a unique uh, password. So, so all... I was going to say, also, all of that is just in my vault. Um, I can store it uh, securely. I can um, sort it any way I want. I can put it into folders. So now it, it's uh, easy. So instead of saying, hey, now I have to remember 600 passwords, I just have to remember one. There is a, a real push for people to turn on two-factor authentication. And, and I tell clients sometimes that if you're using a password manager, and you're not using second two-factor authentication, it's kind of like storing all of your stuff in your car and then putting a direct content directory listing on the outside because if they get access to the vault somehow, they have not only all of your usernames and passwords, but they know where they all go and th th they have all the sites and stuff. So it's, it becomes paramount to keep that safe. Can you talk a little bit about what two-factor authentication is and why it's important to have on a password manager does Bitwarden work with two-factor authentication? And if so, uh, how? Yeah, absolutely. So to touch on your first aspect of what is two-factor authentication, you know, it's if we envision our Bitwarden vault as a safe, which it's very aptly named, 
you know, it's not just having a combination lock, but it's the equivalent of also requiring a fingerprint scan to get access. And so if any one of those methods are compromised, you know that you're still protected because there are bad actors that are doing everything in their power to get access to both of those things. So it's just an added layer of defense that in the case that one, either your password or however you're using two-factor authentication, whether that be email or an application or a hardware key, you know that in the event that one of those is compromised, your password is still secure. Now, that's just within the vault. Now, what Bitwarden, the, well, how Bitwarden also works with two-factor authentication is that um, we also allow Bitwarden to store your two-factor codes. So that's an added layer of convenience for other sites that require two-factor. You can store that within the login information. Um, so it's super helpful in ensuring that you're taking all the best practices for um, best security practices within your digital life. Can you talk about what Bitwarden Authenticator is and what are some examples of services that work with Bitwarden Authenticator? Yeah, so the Bitwarden Authenticator app is essentially built into the Bitwarden platform. And I touched on it just a little bit, uh, but what it allows you to do is it allows you when you're ever prompted to set up a two-factor authenticator, you can actually, rather than using the application or the email associated with it, you can store the two-factor authenticator within the login itself. And so what some of the pro um, some of the tools that are in services that are compatible with it is, you know, most enterprise software that I use day to day on my, my work day requires two factor to be set up based on our administrative settings. And so instead of you having to pull out my phone, waiting for my authenticator app to uh, sync, I know that the authenticator app within Bitwarden is working with those, uh, with those services. Um, personally, some, uh, some banks support this. So if you're using it on a personal basis, you could use it for a banking application or other things such as social media or an email client. So it's really where as long as the service supports a third party authentication rather than just your email or text messaging, Bitwarden Authenticator can fill that gap. Can you talk a little bit about what recovery codes are and how they relate to two-factor authentication? Somebody is going out there and they say, oh, I'm gonna, I just, they just told me to enable two-factor, so I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden, maybe they lose their phone or they lose their device. Now what? So um, your recovery code um, is, is a um, string of letters and numbers that your, your, that, is created when you uh, set up two-factor login. So in Bitwarden, if you're when you set up your two-step login, um, at the end it creates a recovery code. So this is a string of uh, letters and numbers that we recommend that you print and put in a safe and secure place. So if, for example, you lose your phone or you, um, you know, lose your device that you use the most, you can um, and that has uh, stores your uh, two-factor authentication keys you can actually use uh, that recovery code to um, restore, um, restore your account. So a lot of uh, third-party authenticators don't give you access to your TOTP seed. So what a recovery code does, it gives you access to your, um, your two-factor. So when you put that in, it uh, creates a new TOTP seed. Can you talk a bit about users that have been compromised? Somebody's out there and they're saying to themselves, I don't really need a password manager. Um, what's really going to happen? What's wrong if I just memorize my password or use the same password on all of these different sites? What does it look like when a user is compromised and their accounts are taken over? Yeah, that that's something that I dealt with when I, not personally, but just as a fear of mine before moving to a password manager. Um, you know, I can admit this because it's not how I operate now online, but I used to use my dog's name and the year I was born as my password across all of my accounts. And before that, I had to depend on the security of some random site 
that I was putting the same password that I was using my banking of, uh, banking information. And so that puts you in a really precarious situation because while the banking might be very secure and store your password safely, those other potentially not as secure websites that don't practice the best practices also could potentially open you to exposure in other aspects of your life. So that's really what it can look like. You might not even under know if you're compromised. And so one of the great features within Bitwarden is we once you've added passwords as well as other, um, if, as long as you add passwords to Bitwarden, you can actually run a report that allows you to see if your password or ID was or login ID was exposed in a known data breach. So a lot of people are probably compromised and they don't even know. In Bitwarden, we have a tool to, um, to help see if you have been compromised in your online life. So this is, again, that value-added feature that comes back into Bitwarden. Any, you, there's a number of different pieces of software out there. Many of them are open source that will manage passwords for you. But this is something that you guys do as a company and as a service to your customers. You will watch the sites that have that 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 report data breaches, and then you'll come back and say, "Hey, you, we see that you have you, you have an account here, and this site has been compromised. So you might want to do something about this, or go rotate your password." Absolutely. And it will tell you at, um, it will also give you the known events that it's associated with. So that's another key pace, place so you can see potentially what website or what, um, what went down and then the date that it happened. So really helpful, super helpful in my life as I began migrating and I found that some of my passwords had been exposed and they were actually being used for other critical, critical things in my life. So. So we have our personal life sorted out. We've got, we're on a password manager. We're using it. We've set up two-factor authentication. Life is pretty good. But now I get to work. Bitwarden has an entire commercial offering, an entire enterprise offering. And I want to dig into that a little bit. Tell me a little bit about collections and user groups and, and Bitwarden's ability to enable easy and secure sharing of logins and vault items across teams for accounts that maybe offer only a single sign-on. So something like a social media account where we have to log in as this user in order to do the thing that we have to do. How do we share that access? How do we share those credentials securely and conveniently across a team? Well, that's a great question. And, um, you know, as a Bitwarden employee, we use uh, Bitwarden uh, collections and groups to share uh, those those uh, shared uh, credentials on a daily basis. So, for example, when I am doing my weekly trainings, I am using the Bitwarden uh, marketing Zoom account, um, which is used a lot by the marketing department. I can go into my Bitwarden organization vault, uh, log in um, using my credentials, and Bitwarden has shared the permissions with me in a collection um, so I can access that and then use it. So it's very easy and scalable uh, with your collections. Um, the collections are what we really call our shared folders. Um, so that gives so you, uh, you'd you be put into a collection and then the collection is really where we put uh, where we can group the different uh, credentials. Now with groups, you can set up your group by department, you can set it up by function. That just puts people in, uh, in, a, in a, you know, it puts people in a group and, those, and the groups have access to collections. And then, you know, once, you, once you're put into that group, you inherit the permissions um, that your administrator or, your, or the owner of that organization gives you. So you can easily scale um, your permissions and access that collection. So it's really easy and, uh, to implement, it just takes a couple of steps. Um, you can find out more about that um, on our help site at bitwarden.com slash help. So we're able to share this information. How about sending secure information? Can you talk a little bit about Bitwarden Send, what that feature is and how it might be useful to people who need to share secure information across the internet? Yeah, um, so Bitwarden Send is probably one of my favorite features Bitwarden has to offer. Um, it's included in our plans and what it allows you to do is while the collections and user groups is great for sharing information that is constantly being accessed by set users, uh, Send is a great way to share uh, secure information 
on maybe not secure channels. And essentially what Bitwarden Send is, is it allows you to add an encrypted, it allows you to add a file that is encrypted or text, uh, sorry, text or other kind of file type and allows you to send it via an encrypted hyperlink to the end user. I use this a lot with my wife when she needs information that is, uh, I don't wanna send over text, such as like an SS, uh, a social security number. I can add it to a Bitward and send. I can send it, she can access that link and access it in a secure way rather than sending the securities, uh, my social security number via a text message. This can be done with so many different um, activities and fi files and uses that it's a great way to ensure that you're sending information securely no matter the channel and not depending on the, the, the way in which that information is transferred to ensure that it's secure. Yeah, one of the great uh, features about Bitwarden Send is that the person receiving uh, the secure information doesn't have to be a Bitwarden uh, client or Bitwarden customer. So they can still uh, decrypt that file um, you can uh, using the, the secure link. So it's a feature that, you know, especially now with TaxTime, you're sending a lot of uh, different uh, sensitive information, and we offer uh, Bitwarden Send as a way to share that information securely without having to worry about um, all of your personal secrets going out uh, being broadcast to the world. So let's say I'm using Bitwarden and I've signed up as my personal account. I go to my employer, I say, hey, I think we should be using Bitwardens for Teams. They say, no, we're not doing that. We do what you want, pound sand. And I go back and I say, okay, so now I'm going to have to manage both my work passwords and my personal passwords. What is the best practice for doing that? Should I set up an entirely separate account for my, for my work stuff and have my personal stuff separate? Should I have one account? Is there a, is there a feature or service that Bitwarden offers that could maybe help me solve that? Yeah. So th the best way <laughs> you know, as, you know, as you talk about running an MSP and working with lots of different customers, um, you know, in a perfect world, we have a completely delineated separation between our work lives and our personal lives. Now, is that always feasible? No, it's not. And so the best way that I would recommend is, you know, creating a Bitwarden account that is associated with your work email and then having a Bitwarden account that is associated with your personal email and just keeping those separate to ensure that um, to ensure that those that data is kept separately. That's just more a person. Uh, that's just an easier way to manage it. But in the event that you are keeping it all on one account, Bitwarden allows you to create folders to help store and share and uh, store your information in an organized format. So. That's how I would recommend it and how I've done it in the past. But in the perfect world, I always prefer just to separate things as much as possible. Are there any projects coming up or where is Bitwarden looking to go? It's amazing to me the progress that you guys have made in the past few years. And I remember I was a LastPass user. So I was one of those people that started on, on LastPass. And when they made a series of decisions that started to make me upset, and I tried a bunch of different password managers to include the ones that were open source, but there was always a compromise being made somewhere. And, and Bitwarden was the first product that came out. It was open source. It had the ability to be self-hosted. It was secured because only I had access to those private keys and it had all of the conveniences that I could go to my customers and say, hey, all you have to do is go to bitwarden.com, sign up, you can install the extension on Firefox, Chrome, Safari, you can install the app on your iOS or Android device and it's just going to work for you. So it's all of the flexibility and all of the convenience that I had I had come to expect with other services and yet it, it, it really struck a chord with with the technical offering and the ability to grow and the ability to really own your data. And so I've, I've very much been appreciative of Bitwarden's stance on privacy and security. What can we look forward to in the next coming months or in the next coming years for Bitwarden? What's next? No, some of the big things is definitely take a look at our roadmap um, in our community that's been posted really some big things that we're looking to do is you know continue to update some of our top features that our um, customers have asked for and our users whether that be some ui updates 
Uh, we also have some bigger updates that we're, we're not necessarily privy to up, uh, talk about yet, but there's definitely some things as we think about when you just are ultimately trying to refine our product and to really provide our customers the experience that they look to. So, you know, as, as a lot of last pass, uh, as I'll probably cut that, but um, as we just look to expand and grow our product to meet the needs of our customers. John and Alfred, they are from Bitward and guests this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Hey, thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking the time to chat with us today. We'll get you back on the program soon. Thank you so much, Noah. It was great thank to be on. Thank you so on. much, Noah. It was a pleasure. The music in our ears means we're out of time. Hey, thanks for joining us. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do that. I'm at Colonel Linux. He's at Linux Ovens. You can catch the show notes, which have all of the articles and references we use to make the show. You can find those at podcast.asknoahshow.com. The show is recorded every Tuesday. We'll be back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com. Have a good week. <laughs>